This is Tiffany Rosier, the host of the Afros and Nice podcast. We use the Anchor podcasting app to create and distribute the show. Creating a podcast on Anchor is effortless. It allows you to record a high-quality podcast and distribute it everywhere, including Google Podcast and Apple Podcast. They distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. No fancy equipment or podcasting experience is necessary, and it's 100% free. As long as you have a story to tell, Anchor is the platform to use. Share your story through audio using the Anchor app for audio, for Android, iPhone, or your desktop. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. What does it mean to be a visionary or a thought leader? What is a legacy and how do you build one? This week's conversation is with culinary leader, influencer, and founder of Just Call Me Chef, Chef Cat. We'll explore her cooking history, talk about the community and movement that she's created, and examine what the future could look like for young, talented Black chefs. This is the Afros and Knives podcast, and I am your host, Chef Tiffany. Listen to the Afros and Knives podcast on iTunes, Anchor, Google Podcast, Spotify, and anywhere else you may podcast. New episodes are available every Tuesday. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. This week, I want to give an Afros and Knives shout out to Sandra Harvey, creator and designer of the Sandra Harvey Chef Coat. She knows that women want to be outfitted in a garment that supports us being powerfully feminine in every role. Sandra Harvey Chef Coats feature clean lines, thin seams, and deep side pockets with a snatched waist, fabric that grazes the hips, and slender cut sleeves with a tall mock French cuff that is meant to be pushed up the arm instead of rolled. These beautiful jackets are designed to celebrate the feminine form and offer a flawless fit. Each coat is a blend of organic cotton poplin, twill, and a touch of lycra for a bit of comfortable stretch. All jackets are designed, patterned, and produced in the United States. To view and purchase the complete line of Sandra Harvey chef coats, pants, chef shirts, and aprons, visit www.sandraharvey, that's H-A-R, B-E-Y dot com. Thank you so much, Sandra, for supporting our collective chef drip and inspiring a new generation of women in the kitchen. Hey, everyone. I'm Katina Smith, but everyone calls me Chef Cat. I'm born and kind of raised in Baltimore. I was, I'm a little bit of a Navy brat, so I've been around. But for the majority of my life, I've been in Baltimore City. Um, I'm not exactly sure how I decided to become a chef. Um, I know growing up, I did watch Food Network and I watched like Emerald Lagasse and Bobby Flay, but I, I never really saw any black women, but I just still love cooking. Um, my family actually thought I was going to be the lawyer of the family, but that didn't happen that way. I ended up actually going to culinary school right after high school. Um, and it's, pretty cool like just like Nina I actually joined the Air Force um one year into culinary school I went the reserve the reserve route um let's see what else uh I kind of worked in Garmage um when I came back from the um, Air Force basic training but then I fell into the government because when you join the military, you get like a security clearance. So having that security clearance gave me like access to a whole another level of thing. And I'm like, Oh, that money looks good. Better than line cook money. So I went ahead and went the government route, went ahead and finished my bachelor's and, um, master's degree. Um, so it was tugging at me after a while though, just sitting behind a desk. I knew that wasn't, um, for me. So I went ahead and took a huge pay cut and um, I went and worked a line cook job at a college. Um, it was absolutely horrible. It, it definitely wet my whistle for what I wanted to do. I was happy to be back in food, but that wasn't the kind of place that I saw myself being in. 
so they were building the casino, Horseshoe Casino in Baltimore. And me being a little bit cocky, I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and apply for the sous chef position. Um, I did a blind tasting, like a black box challenge situation, and I got it. Um, I worked there for a while. Uh, it was crazy, especially because it was just opening. I was working like 17 hours a day, like for a month straight. So that was nuts. But um, after that, my culinary career escalated very quickly. Um, I went ahead after that and became an executive chef at Notre Dame University. And then I was an executive chef at um, a very popular um, cafe in Baltimore. Um, But then I decided that my career was going too fast and that I was still a student. And I wanted to learn and really, I was starting to fall too much into management, meaning like paperwork. And that's not what I wanted at that time, especially because this is only like three to four year period. So I still have so much to learn. So I kind of stepped back and I took a line cook position at Magdalena, which is one of the only, I believe, um, Relay and Chateau restaurants in Maryland. So I've never worked fine dining before, but once I got a taste of that, that's when I knew that the kind of cuisine that I wanted to cook. Um, but along the way, like, let me give you a little backstory. The whole time that I'm cooking, I'm also side hustling. I'm doing catering. I'm hosting my own events. Um, and the hosting my own events is when I started getting a little popular. Uh, the traction started to um, gain with my with what I was doing. So after that, I decided, hey, I, I need to create some sort of um, like networking for chefs that we can collab with each other. We can know each other because in Baltimore, it's so small. We're running into each other all the time. And I didn't like that feeling of competition. So what I did was created something called the Baltimore Chef Alliance. Where we met, where we meet monthly, just to hang out with each other, kick it, see how we can help each other, just um, lean on each other. Really, we've kind of grown into a family. Um, and after that, I knew I wanted to kind of focus on Black women chefs because we weren't getting the notoriety that we needed to. So that's how my whole "Just Call Me Chef" movement came to fruition. So we'll get in a little bit of that, but that's where I am right now. So right now, I'm a line cook at. Um, copper kitchen but I'm also doing all my private chef things too so that's pretty cool um I'm getting some pretty high-end clients so I'm excited about the growth of my personal chef career as well well y'all I mean come on um with the strong, <laughs> came, a I was like she came through with the strong resume and uh <laughs> in the mighty bio I'm like I appreciate that <laughs> um, but <laughs> I was like but thank you so much I mean because you see I you know I see your Instagram and I see you on social media and I'm like this girl is out here out hustling everybody <laughs> right now yeah. hustling and, hard. <laughs> girl and I just and I appreciate you because it's such a great example of like I, th- I think a lot of people have gotten a little like disenchanted with this idea that hard work does take you somewhere Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's like watching um, other black women really not just hustle hard, but hustle smart. Like they make right. better decisions to like actually move themselves forward and not sideways. Um, right. you know, I, I appreciate seeing people move strategically because I don't think we see enough of that. We do get like this, the hard hustle message out there. Everyone's like, you need right. to hustle and get your hustle on and get your side hustle on. But they never really talk about like how to do it. Like, how do you do that? I was definitely doing that for a while. And then I decided, you know what, this isn't even really making any sense. And then mm. I had to go back to the drawing board. So definitely, I understand that. You know, and it, it's funny because it's like it takes some guts to, uh, you know, to pause and go, wait, this this is okay, but it's not mm-hmm. moving me further. It's I'm moving, but I, I'm, I'm making up, you know, I'm, I'm busy and I, I, there's a right. ton of movement in my life, but I'm not going anywhere. So to stop exactly. and like go, hold up, let's let's try this again. For me, is like that's that's everything. That's like, that is it experience and maturity talking every single time because young people be out here burning themselves out and you're like look <laughs> look you're doing too much and you're not going nowhere doing so chill the most <laughs> <laughs> you did bring up something interesting that I wanted to kind of unwrap a little bit and one of my uh previous interviews actually with Nicole Taylor she we were talking about um African Americans working in fine dining and specifically, of course, in the United States, it's not an area that you see us in very frequently. Um, you just don't you just don't see the, the the people on the line. And I, you know, like I told her, I don't think it's because we're not there. I just don't think people associate 
black people with fine dining. And, you know, we kind of covered a couple of points, like, you know, essentially American cuisine was built on the backs of of African slaves. And so the the reason why the country even has a cuisine to call its own is because of us. And so for me, fine dining seems like a really natural space for for black people to live in and to work in because we were the ones who set up those so, those dining rooms who set up you know who set the table who right. set the meals so when you got Absolutely. into fine dining specifically what do, what do you think like the barriers to entry to that specific style of cuisine is especially for black people um and and you know and even more so for black women um, I guess I would say, and and I just want to like a little bit of like some other thoughts that I have about that is that coming into culinary school, if you or if you don't go the culinary school route, that's fine too. But just kind of having an idea in your head of what kind of chef you want to be definitely helps you because you, you become more focused. So when I graduated from culinary school, I had no idea what kind of chef I wanted to be. I was just bright eyed and bushy tailed to be in anybody's kitchen. But if I would have known that I wanted to go the fine dining route, I think that I would have started that instead of just bouncing around in random um, restaurants. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for that experience, but if I, I would have been further along um, in, in fine dining, if I would have kind of just like had an idea of what I wanted. And, and I've met some people like that, like, oh, I knew from day one that I was going to be working for so-and-so and, you know, like these fancy restaurants. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know anything about that. So kind of just doing your due diligence as a student to figure out what's your thing, kind of like what's your niche. Even if you have to play around with it for a while, that's cool. But kind of just know the direction that you want to head in. And so once I did, um, I saw Chef Mark Levy post the job position that was open for Magdalena. And, and, you know, I have so many outlets, so I just threw it out there like, hey, somebody need a job. Here's something right here. And then I was like, you know what? He posted it again. I said, God, is that you telling me that job's for me? (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, I didn't even think that I even qualify for anything like that because I've never done fine dining. But I'm like, you know, I I do a little razzle dazzle. So maybe, maybe I could be okay in this. And, and all you really need is just some common sense and and focus, a little bit of discipline, but you will learn the discipline there for sure. Um, So just come in, just ready to learn, uh, leave your um, ego at the door because what you thought you knew is nothing uh, when you go into fine dining. Um, I was the only black female in my kitchen full of white men. Um, So you already have to go in knowing you got to work twice as hard. And that's just, I think in, in, in any industry, black women, that's what we have. That's our fight. Yeah. Um, So um, I just went in like, Oh wow, this is brand new to me. I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. I'm going to, you know, of course I, I didn't have any of the disciplines because I, I hadn't ever worked in um under a chef that was so um what's the word? I don't know, just passionate about what he did. So whenever I would make a mistake, he would be on my ass. Uh cat, why are you why are you cutting it that way? That's not how you do it. Why is your area looking like that? Why are you not more organized? And and I've learned so much from him and and I just didn't see that growing up, like even on like the Food Network, I didn't see any black women or even I can't even run off like a list of names of black female executive chefs in Baltimore, really. Girl, come maybe on. A, maybe a handful, but they probably own the spot, too. And and, and, and it's probably a soul food place. Absolutely. So, so, to, so to name um, an exec, black woman executive chef of a fine dining um, establishment, I don't I don't know any. Mm. Mm. And for uh, me, that, that I, has that changes my life every time I hear that. Cause I usually will ask that question to people. I'm like, can you mm-hmm. name me? I'm like, they need, you don't even have to name me a gender. Just give me a name of a, a, a black person in the position mm-hmm. of an executive chef in a fine dining restaurant. And right. most times you just get absolute silence and a blank stare. Right. And, <laughs> you know, and then to add to that question, I typically go and, and then if you can figure out one of those names, name me one that has a Michelin star. And then it's really right. quiet. And I'm just like, so does that, I mean, it's the fact that black people have been cooking in this country for this long and you right. can't name one that's in a fine dining restaurant as an executive chef. You can't name one that has a Michelin star. Like you tell me 
that thing that equality has reached the restaurant industry, and then we can have right. a new conversation. But it's and I was but I was definitely treated differently in the kitchen for sure. Like you could feel it. Like I don't know if it was like a little bit of racism, definitely like sexism for sure. But um, you just gotta have really tough skin. You you have to if you're gonna make it because then they're just gonna um it'll eat away at you. So I was like, you know what? They're not going to scare me out of here. I'm going to make it for all of us. Okay. For the culture, better... I'm going to make it. <laughs> uh, I'm like, she like, for everybody, we going through this. Wow. Shoot. Right. Girl. So I, I mean, worked there. Uh-huh. Yeah. I worked there about a year. So it was, it was really tough, but I learned a lot. Um, And I, that's why I definitely want to stay in fine dining. Um, what else can I say? Um, for women that want to come into fine dining, um, I just say practice. Literally practice when you're at home. I practice techniques. I'm on YouTube watching um, how to make certain things. If I hear them say a term that I'm unfamiliar with, I kind of jot it down in my notebook so I get home and look it up. Like, oh, that's what that meant. You know, speaking French culinary terms or whatever. Like, oh, I never heard of that. Let me look that up when I get home and then I can use it when I get back to work. <laughs> I mean, that's really the game. Yeah. Yeah. Like constantly putting yourself in a position of a student and dry and drive. Like you have to know, like, okay, no, I I probably could go into this, this kitchen as a Sue or as an exec, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to put myself on the line, um, you know, in, in, in Garage because I want to learn more um, than I know. And, um, uh, and to dig up just a little bit deeper on the topic, I, you know, I'm looking for, because I'd asked this question in a previous interview too, is that what can, what do you think we can be doing as a community to encourage young black chefs to have the ambition of someone who aspires to work in fine dining? I think it's funny that, you know, you, young, young black kids don't get those names in their, in those conversations. They don't hear about things like the French laundry and per se, and they're very, you know, they don't get all of those names dropped around them. So they wouldn't know to even aspire to be in those spaces when they are perfectly capable and perfectly talented and they could definitely do that. And it's just, I think it's a matter of exposure. So what, you know, like, what do you, what do you see as an, um, I guess as a, a way for us to expose more um, young black people who are aspiring to work in culinary to, you know, expose them to all of these names and to the names of these chefs and these restaurants. I think it's definitely like, like in culinary school, I don't remember them mentioning any of those kind of name those names to me. Like I found them out on my own. So it is up to our educators. I think um, the culinary programs that might be going on in the city, like um, my friend is the founder of the nonprofit black girl cook, and they are doing some amazing things with those girls over there. They're farming, they mm. have cooking competitions and, and I'm pretty sure they're learning about all of that. And they're between the ages of I want to say I'm like 10 to 14 years old. So it it just, we have to get them into those classes. We have to, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. So I know a local high school here has a culinary program. So those teachers need to be saying those kind of names instead of, uh, instead of just the basic, oh, you know, like, I feel like we, some of these programs are doing a, a disservice because, like I said, I went to a culinary school with plenty of black people, but where are they at, though? You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, okay. It's, it's at work. Where do where wow. you, you go? Yeah, yeah. And that was, and it's funny because that's a, it's a common, it's, it's been a common theme in every interview. It's like, well, I went to school with this number of black people, but I have not, mm-hmm. I have yet to see them anywhere. Um, right. They don't, they, you know, and it's, you, you. They're <laughs> working at hospital kitchens or right. whatever. And it's, I don't know. I d- and it's, it's a mystery to me and I'm like maybe you know I told people like maybe through this first season of interviews we will all collectively kind of figure out like what yeah. is, is happening because it's but it has to be a pat like this is not a job for the the lighthearted at no. all it's no. hard it's physically demanding and it's it's an emotional job you have to have the passion for it so Absolutely. some people go into it just because it's you know it's easy you don't you don't have to be book smart to, right, to right. do it but you do have to have a certain level of passion and um, care to do it. Um, like I love cooking. I love, I take when I'm cooking anything, I'm, I'm respecting my ingredients. 
I'm thinking about how my customer is going to receive it, how I want it to look on the plate. I want this colors. I want this on this angle. You know what I'm saying? Like you, it's a, it's a passion. We are artists and we're very passionate people. So if you don't have that passion, I don't think you're going to be successful in the industry. This is true. And I feel like, yeah, I, you know, I think the uh, the history of the black community overall, I think we do have this, you know, kind of integral characteristic of hustling and and mm-hmm. hard no matter what we're doing and so that's mm-hmm. why I'm always like you know what the kitchen is so suited to our our energy and to our ambition that I'm it always surprises me that you just don't see more of us working in the industry because I'm just like it just mm-hmm. it just fits how we roll most of the time like we will go hard on a lot of stuff and, right and I see I see that a lot lately too like a lot of like the home cooks you know, uh, self-titling themselves chef and, and it, it becoming like a, almost like a rock star situation. Like, Oh, I'm a chef. You know, that's a rock star situation, the glitz and glam of it. But, but nobody's talking about the hard work behind it. And, and you know, people are, um, and, and I, I hate when people just automatically assume though that I, I'm cooking soul food, and, and I want to get and I and I want to get away from that. You know, oh cat, can you make uh, me some mac and cheese? And I'm like, of course I can make it. But when have you ever seen me post anything like that? Like that ain't even my style. Can we talk about it? I remember <laughs> when I moved to Nashville, someone asked me to do a private catering for a for a couple of leaders um, in the community, and I grew up in South Jersey, outside of Philadelphia. So mm-hmm. I am not a Southern girl by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and, you know, so when I proposed my, when I offered these menu proposals and I'm like, well, this is what I was thinking about. And they're looking at these menus like, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> minute, well, right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You're black and you're in the South. And we made an assumption that you were going to fry mm-hmm. some chicken and serve some baked macaroni. <laughs> Right. I was like, I have no interest in any of that. I mean, the food is delicious. And I know, you know, mm-hmm. when I go to family reunions and my family puts it up, you know, it's always good and I'm always happy to see it. But that's just not how I grew up. Like, you know, my friends right. were Italian and Jewish and not, you know, I wasn't surrounded by a bunch of black kids. Like my closest neighbor on one side growing up was Jamaican. And then the lady down the street was like Irish. I'm like, so I don't know what you're talking about right now. And so right. <laughs> I kinda, like me, I, I absolutely love Asian cuisine, so pretty oh, much whatever girl. I think probably has some sort of Asian influence. Absolutely. There's always, I, for me, I'm like, I got addicted to cooking Korean food for a couple of years, and so like now everything I do just has this little string of that mm-hmm. kind of obsessive work in it, and mm-hmm. so like, you know, eventually I had to step back and go, okay, well, you know, what you learn as a chef like that, what you do really is for the diner. It's for the person who's about to eat. Right. And you do have a space of self-expression, but at the end of the day, the only way you're going to make any of that coinage is if you're preparing a meal for the person who's going to eat it. So I did have to take a step back and like remember where I was and like read the room a little bit and go, okay, so you guys want Uh want this like fried chicken meal and stuff like that. So I just had to like (laughs) personalize it to what I, something I could be proud of and something that I could connect to. But yeah, it's Uh true. Like whenever you have a conversation with people about black chefs in general, the first thing they think about is that, oh, are you going to open a soul food restaurant or something? type of southern cuisine restaurant you're just like no we do more than i could cook whatever don't put some respect on my name (laughs) i was like what you want to what did you want me to cook and what i cook are really two different questions um I've been listening to uh, notes from a young black chef on audible Uh and it's just such a similar similar refrain Uh from from black chefs like uh why does everybody assume all we do is southern food and i got to meet him a couple of weeks ago that was pretty cool you know i was i mean every single chapter i'm like this boy i'm gonna have to (laughs) i'm like where can i send him an offering um (laughs) because he is really i heard you know preaching that preaching that word right now so it's yeah you know i need more and it's beautiful like it's like you do need more voices to to be to speak about it because representation right right now is everything it is everything so, it is. so tell me a little bit more about just call me chef like the inception and like where where you want it to go and what your vision for the future of that organization is so just call me chef um came about as a passion project to highlight black women chefs 
Um, after I like dove a little deeper, I noticed there was a need for the organization to shine light on um, the disparity between white male chefs and non-chefs of color and black female chefs in the culinary arena. Um, we've been cooking since the beginning. So like you said, like we've been doing this. So I don't understand why the, num- the numbers aren't adding up. Um, there's a severe lack of representation in the industry. Um, we're always usually at the lower positions. And like I said, I can't even name five, uh, maybe even two uh, black women executive chefs. So I wanted to kind of create a sisterhood um, where we can kind of lean on each other because I think that once you're around like your circle, you guys can kind of elevate one another. So it all begins, I think, with unity. So, um, so right now it started kind of as a, it did start as a calendar. Um, so I launched that calendar, uh, in December of last year, but just rolling into the whole launch of the calendar was pretty cool. Um, connecting with some chefs that I knew and some that I didn't and just creating that bond amongst us where so many of the women in the calendar are doing their own collabs together. They're like true friends now. And now that I've begun the search for the 2020 calendar, that it's all the camaraderie has already started with these ladies already. Oh, I didn't know Chef Donato. Oh, you work here, you work there, and oh, I'm gonna come support your restaurant. Like just already connecting with one another and creating that sisterhood. So um, the goal is to a create that sisterhood, um, and then also be able to create um, opportunities for these chefs. So I've already kind of done a little bit of footwork, just reaching out to different restaurants saying, hey, you know, I have this organization, would you be willing to hire one of the women in my organization? And they're saying yes, and I'm going to, you know, hire end type restaurants, but I'm, I'm just one person and I'm trying to do everything. So I'm trying to delegate these things and break it down by chapter by city. So I've already had like nominated someone for Philly and someone for Baltimore to kind of start doing that footwork for me in these different cities. Like this has the potential to be nationwide and worldwide. So I think I'm sitting on a huge idea. Um, There are several, um, you know, organizations kind of like mine, like a she chef, uh, women in hospitality uh, and and things of that nature. Um, But I think I'm coming at it at a different angle, kind of like, going at it from this sisterhood perspective right um but just being able to raise money so that I can give out scholarships so I can so I can give uh like business seed money um things like that so that I can travel to different cities and highlight black women-owned business or led businesses um so I did like much more in my own city of course I'm like man I didn't even know that was owned by a black woman I'm like see um or in, in doing that in other cities, just so people can um, know. Um, what else? Um, so that's pretty much it. Being able to uh, create a sisterhood, a sense of community amongst us, um, scholarships, internships. Um, and yeah, so, so far it's going pretty good. My city embraced me. And then I, I was recently on um, CBS Good Morning. So I'm like, man, that's huge. That's a um, nationwide stage. Um, I was just interviewed uh, with um, Carrie from Cherry Bomb. So that was pretty major. And, and I'm just excited to see what else is coming up next. All right. Well, it's funny because like after um, connecting with you, like, you know, last year even and seeing what you were doing, it's really, uh, it was really a huge part of me, you know, creating this audio space um, uh-huh. as well, because I was just like, you know what, there needs to be a, a place for black women to like come who work in these specific industries to come and really just talk about the issues we're having, the the things that we're overcoming, the victories, the, the ambitions uh-huh. we have, and it, you know, and really just kind of air out, you know, the challenges that we really can't talk to with any. Right. Uh, talk and, and, like I, and like I said, I was like, this is a, a wow is me type of situation. This isn't a woe is me. So I don't want to make people think, oh, we're, you know, we're black chefs and, and we're, we're capable or something like that. Or we're, right. we're always facing these challenges, but that we're, we rise to the occasion exactly. and, and, and we shine it at, every turn every corner um exactly and we fight the, we fight the hardest we uh, we always have i think we always will 
This but is we true. rise to the occasion every time. You know, and it's I was hoping I'm like, look, we will you will not be disappointed if, if a black woman shows up in your space and she is prepared <laughs> to have some time and some you time know it. to your situation. <laughs> Understand we will leave that thing better than how if we found it. So like don't ever yeah. shy away from, you know, mm-hmm. a conversation or us participating um in something that you're building or something that you're doing. So Right. Um, so for the calendar for 2020, do you, um, you know, what can someone do to, if they, if they want to be a part of the calendar, if they have someone they'd like to nominate for the calendar, like what's your process? Um, so I have, I'm, I'm, I'm down to two people. So I just need two more chefs. And what I'm looking for are two, either executive or two chefs, uh, restaurant chefs. Right now I've been overwhelmed with, um, like home cooks and, and that's not what this calendar about is about. Like the whole purpose is for, either aspiring chefs, young girls to see that I can be, you know, a chef running a, you know, a kitchen. Right. So that, right. so that's what, so that's what it's all about. So I have pastry chefs that are executive pastry chefs, I have people that own their own catering businesses. Um, so I'm kind of looking for like higher level, you know, so when these girls are looking, oh, I see, I can rise to this high level. Exactly. Exactly. I think, I, you know, I love, I love what the like what media has done for home cooking. It's really kind of given people an idea that it's it's still necessary. You know what I mean? It's still a necessary practice. Feeding yourself at home is still a skill you should have. Um, right. At the same time, because African American women specifically have been always uh-huh. connected with kind of the uh, maid role or the, uh-huh. you know, right, yeah, the house like the help. role. Uh, it's hard to set to make that distinction for us. It's a little easier. Uh-huh. Um, you know, when you're talking about men and, and even black men, but black women, because we are so put to this, this witness box uh-huh. that when you kind of uh-huh. talk about, um, professional cooking. Uh, and, right. And, and I'm like, it, I'm like, there's a total, there's a total so different. difference. <laughs> exactly. Like, I'm not trying to put you down, not at right. all, but, but you have to respect the, the people that either A, did go to school for it, Right. Or or have been working from the bottom to get to the top in this industry. Like you you cooking at home is not the same as you run a line on a night shift at a exactly. restaurant. It's not. I think that discussion, like when I first started cooking professionally, I had that discussion more frequently than I had any other. Um, yeah, was, I, hate, I hate the like, conversation. Uh, <laughs> I hate that conversation. Uh, I'm not trying to send people like, oh, cat, you think you're better than me. I'm like, I don't think I'm better than you. I think I'm a professional. This right, it's a I distinction. It is a literal right. distinction. And it's like, so, and the only other, the only time I ever can manage to overcome that for them is if I actually pull them in to some work I'm doing. I'm like, well, look, right. if you like just, come, just the difference between my knife skills and yours tells you the all day, you know what I'm all, day all day long. Um, I always look at somebody's scallions like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, I'm judging that. I'm judging that real hard. Uh, you know, um, I mean, but your food tastes great, but you can tell when yeah. somebody's professional. There's a refinement to professional cooking. And right. I, and just, put, and just right. respect it. That's all. That's all I'm saying. And it's like, because the more it, within the community, the more we can respect mm-hmm. the distinction, the more people mm-hmm. outside of the community will respect the distinction because right. they throw all of us in the same group and they'll be like, mm-hmm. oh, so as a black, you know, and I've definitely shown up in kitchens where it's like, okay, is this black woman showing up to this kitchen? She must uh-huh. be a great home cook. And then when I get to doing something, they're like, oh, so you really do this. I'm like, what? Oh, is, you what, cook, what, cook. What? Oh, yeah. oh like, you what? a chef, chef. <laughs> This is what, it's just like hearing somebody saying, oh, so you like black, black. You're like, what does that even right. mean? <laughs> Go ahead with that. Like, I get it. Girl, like, miss me with that foolishness, please. Because, right. no. But yes, I am a professional chef. And, yes, that looks entirely different than what you're doing at home. So, please uh-huh. come over here with that conversation. Okay, so I can aspire to do this. Okay, I, I do realize I have some work to do or, or that I'm not at this particular level. And that's okay. So, now I know, hey, I can find some mentorship in one of these chefs that are here. Because that's what we offer as well. Mentorship, pairing, chef to chef mentorship. Like I, I, you know, I have mentors. I don't know it all. I'm not the best chef at all. But I know what I know what my level is and, exactly. and that I can be sharp that I can be sharper. So it's just 
you know, people just got to put the ego to the side. And, and in this industry, we all have egos. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, I, I think you're almost at a detriment if you don't have a little bit of ego walking in the door. Yeah. Like, you got to have a little bit of cockiness <laughs> in order to make that work. And it's funny, I was watching um, an interview with, ooh, what's that girl? Um, British chef. Her name, first name is April. I cannot remember her last name right now. Yeah. But she was talking. What was funny was it was her, and I was watching one interview right after that, and they were mm-hmm. they both had a very similar thing about women working in kitchens is that the thing, the greatest thing they had to overcome is their self confidence, and mm-hmm. you do have to have a certain level of self confidence because dudes walk in the kitchens and they can have garbage skills and they just think right. things since sliced bread. <laughs> And That's women so will walk true. in and be brilliant and still wonder if they're any good. Right. And so right. I for sure that, you know, like women in general is like that, that's the thing to overcome is like, cause you know, as young women we're we're taught not to have ego and not to mm-hmm. have, you know, that kind of self-confidence. But in this, in this job, you have to have a little bit of some of that. Otherwise right. it'll eat you up. It'll eat you up. It'll be hard to, it'll be hard to manage your, your emotions in a kitchen where everybody else's egos are bigger than yours. And, um, right. And so you just and, don't. and my thing is that um, like I don't believe my legacy is going to be like oh Chef Cat was an amazing you know chef in the kitchen which is fine I, I mean I do have a leg to stand on in the kitchen for sure so I'm like if somebody's trying to come at me I, I have the skill to to back it up but what uh-huh. I, what drives me is my passion for bringing people together and that's what I think I'm going to be known for I love seeing us all work together I love uh, what we can create together um creating opportunities for others uh that's where my passion is for sure I've been working um at this nonprofit called the food project and I've been working with these inner city kids and, and that's where my heart truly is and I and I was I was literally about to ask you that because I've been like following that your experience with them on Instagram and it's like like what what else can you tell us about that organization and like what their their vision is for the future and what their goals are and like how you ended up um in, in relationship with them and working with them um, I had been following them on Instagram for a while. I saw like a couple of my friends doing volunteer work and I was like, I want to be inv- involved with that. So I just started showing up, helping out how I could. And then eventually they asked me to be on the board and, and um, they were having like a kitchen inspection. I was like, Hey, you need to go ahead and try to get us a catering license. Um, and uh, they got the catering license. Said, okay, Kat, well, you're going to develop us a catering program? I'm like, okay. So that's what I'm um, about to start working on now is developing a, a catering program so that we can hire the youth. So we're creating jobs for them. Um, so that's like the next big thing. But it's all about we have – I reach out to chefs all the time to come and um, give demos. We do chef demos on Tuesday. We do different things every day. Um, they'll do yoga, they'll do drumming, they'll do art, they'll do science. Um, so it's pretty much an after school program. And, and this is one of the poorest uh, zip codes in Baltimore City. So these kids are, are having it hard and they really look to us to kind of just um, shine some light on, you know, their daily struggles. So and my point is culinary. So what can I what can I cook with these kids? Showing them how to cook healthy food. They don't have access to the healthy food. So we're trying to bring healthy foods to where they are, show them how to actually cook it. The cooking can be fun. Um yeah, and, and a lot of them, um a couple of we have a uh, maybe about 10 to 12 teenagers. So they're about to start getting into those working years. So we want to start creating some um ways for them to, to earn money. All right. I mean, it's definitely the next generation of of brilliant uh, chefs and cooks kind of, you know, just living in that group of kids somewhere. So it's always, right. I'm like, it's always a worthy investment to teach a kid how to cook. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. you're never going to lose on um, spending some time teaching them how to do right. it. So. Right. Now, right. one of the um, one of the questions I had been sitting on, I really hadn't even had a chance to ask anybody else this, but it's just kind of something I always pay attention to. But, you know, we because we live in a, a space right now where everything is essentially uh, recorded in some way, whether it be video or through, uh, you know, a photograph and it's posted on Instagram and it's just kind of historically, we're kind of keeping track of the, the, the growth of mm-hmm. the world and the society, um, you right. know, so much more now. What, what, in, I mean, in your opinion, of course, what, what are we getting right about how we are showing ourselves in the media and how the media is talking about us and what do we need to work on, not just as a community, but what do you think we need to kind of really, you know, call 
current media on the carpet for it. Like, you know, cause black women, we, we have like this duality in the media at this point, mm-hmm. We're definitely portrayed as like chicken heads and hood rats and all this other business. And we can also be portrayed as like the hard, hardest working people in the world. And mm-hmm. so like, you know, for women who work in food and, you know, spaces of hospitality and service, you know, like, what do you, like, what are we getting right? And what do we have, you know, what do we need to work on in your opinion, especially because you see yourself because you, seeing yourself more and more in media at this point hmm what can we do you said what can we do better yeah what can we do better and what are we getting right what do we need to do more of I think people need to see us unified that's what I I, I think um you know everybody's on their own I'm chef so and so I'm sure so and so you know with that the whole ego trip but for people to see us standing together unified, that would be powerful for um, like some of the top black women chefs, like even like me, Chef L, Chef Carla Hall, like just throwing some names out there to see us unified hosting an event together or something like that. Like I want to eventually host like a black women chef conference um, it, to see something like that. Seeing us unified, I think would, would, um, would be big um but i think we all are out here shining and pushing our agendas and i think we are showing up in such a way like my eyes are definitely open to people with um different movements that are going on um but yeah just staying true to your own identity and your own movement and and just posting as much as you can um i I have a lot of different things going on but i try to capture it post it so people know know what's up like so people can tell my work ethic and the cool things that i'm involved in and that they can get involved as well um but like i said i think that unity thing is is big Mm, agreed agreed it's um yeah i think that's the that's been the the one thing I think we miss as a community, like if we look around and look at other communities, the one thing you'll note is that those communities really, even if they don't like each other very much, they manage to mm-hmm. stay as a unified front. So like, you know, you don't build entire uh, neighborhoods mm-hmm. like, you know, like Chinatown and um, yeah. and, and places like that if you aren't connected as a community. And, you know, like I remember yeah. doing I know I get a lot of like hate, which is crazy because wow. everything I... Yeah, I really do. Uh, but they say if you ain't got no haters, you ain't popping. That's what they you're say. Right, you're right. <laughs> but I'm just like, everything that I do, I, I do with love. I do to help others. Um, I do to encourage others. But I, I don't understand like that whole like crabs in a barrel piece. Mm. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to help you like hey I'm I'm not even at the highest level at my job but I know how to make a phone call I know somebody hit me up cat you know anybody hiring you do you know how how do I get a catering license like I, I'm just sitting on a wealth of knowledge that I'm ready and willing to to, to give to others so um yeah we just got to start with that whole bit right there right like right and it's you know i i know talking about like the food industry and talking about restaurants and building you know finding um finding investors for black restaurants and you know look girl i mean you can see people out here opening restaurants and the food is garbage and the service is terrible but they out here with an investor and you're like well wait a minute what are we what about me i got some actual skills and i'm like and i would love to have you know black investment groups you know show up for the food industry. I mean, you know, to have a black fine dining restaurant that is funded and created by the the community would be incredible. Mm -hmm. But like you said, that requires a specific level of unity that we just don't aspire to, unfortunately. Um, um, And, you know, like I remember doing some, remember doing some research not too long ago about how much uh, about how quickly the dollar leaves the black community and how mm-hmm. long other communities manage to keep the dollar circulating. And so they right. make more money off of that $1 being spent within those communities. Than right. We, I mean, our do- I think they said our it's, dollar leaves the community in under two hours. So the minute, wow. you know, black people getting paid, our money is being spent in every other community but our own. And then, you know, there is that stigma of um, you can't trust. And that's funny. Is, and that mess. Yeah. But like, it's like you we can't fix that unless we spend right. the money within our community. 
Right. And it's funny that you said that because I'm just like, even with my organization that I created, like I am actually a black woman chef and I created this organization for black women chefs. And it's crazy how, how people are hesitant to get behind my movement, but are so quick to join those other, other um, organizations going on. I'm like, this, this, this is for us. I'm like, if you look at their pages, you can see they were sprinkled in there for decoration. And I'm like, this is for us. But yet we're so hesitant still. Like, oh, well, who's cat? Like, it don't matter who I am. I'm for us. Right. And if we get together, then we can make this thing big. Mm. Okay. I just, but it's I like, mean, oh, well, I'm going to join yeah. so-and-so unit because whatever. I'm like, oh, it's led by some white women. Okay. And, and, and no shade on my white women, but it's just like, how come we find more validity in a white organization than an organization created by a black woman for us? Look, now, y'all, you heard this question. <laughs> And I don't I don't need an immediate answer, but I really need people who are listening to think about that. Like, what is it that's happening in your own in your own self that makes you buy in uh-huh. to an organization that doesn't represent you and you know that is not necessarily right. against your interests, but aren't necessarily passionately for your interests either. Uh, right. That's just an that odd part. that's an odd thing to decide to do. I just come you know uh-huh. and, it, and it is it's it's a pretty frequent thing. I know I've been working on a couple of ideas myself and I'm like trying to find I really would love black investors to participate but it's so Uh interesting to try to engage black investors in these conversations and like they're really oh yeah we're always and they tell you oh we're looking for you know black founders black owned businesses but like are you really no (laughs) you know they're you're not because there's a lot of um intelligent passionate brilliant black people out here who are trying to create things for the community that just Uh simply you you just need to cut a check like nobody needs you that's what i need i need girl give me some of this coinage so i can move this to the next level i really don't need a workshop please don't tell me about how i can market myself on social media i already know how to do that thank you kindly here is what i really want to do is like my goal isn't to open a restaurant i want to open a chain of um commercial kitchen space because that's what we lack so many people cooking out of their kitchen doing some weird illegal stuff like hey here is here is some commercial kitchen space for you right here sis to start your catering business or your little uh banana puddings you selling in a, a mason jar whatever you got you, you know what i'm saying well, what, like here's a space for you well, girl, and well, also first of all you just going to go ahead and get out my thought bubble i've been thinking about commercial <laughs> kitchens for i don't even know how long well go ahead that's the move that's the wave that's what we need it's a lack of it, seriously. In Baltimore, we might have like four major uh, shareable kitchens, but there are so many other uh, catering businesses that are just cooking out their house. And I know about those. And, and it's like, okay, we need some <laughs> affordable kitchen space. We need affordable rentable kitchen space. Exactly. And until it's affordable, then those people are going to keep cooking out of their houses. But and just to be able to teach like small cooking classes out of my commercial kitchen space or people are always looking for a place to take professional photographs. So to have that pretty kitchen where people can come in and take their food pictures like I want to be able to provide that. Well, wow. Um, <laughs> it is. is Somebody it, gonna come and take my idea. Don't be taking let my me idea tell off. you something though. Um, <laughs> it's probably been three years, and I literally every time somebody run into me, they're just like, "So, like, what are you working on?" I'm like, "Let me talk to you about a couple of things." And the first <laughs> thing I talk about is like I'm looking to open like a culinary co working space that yes. offers a test kitchen that has a, a, a photography studio that allows <laughs> small businesses to come in and actually just talk with each oh, other. We right really. Back. was t- no. Okay. <laughs> All right. I was like, what is right. really going on? And because Phoenix has a I can't deal with that stress of running a restaurant. Uh, I just, uh, no, I'm it's not, not for me. About it. It's not for nope. me. I, it's nope. like, because once you do it, you know, okay, I'm done. I've outgrown this. This is cool. Y'all can go ahead uh-huh. and have all of this. Because, uh-huh. you know, like, there was a couple of kids I used to have as interns in a few of the kitchens I ran. And the one thing, that's the one thing I used to, like, really impress upon them is that you can be a huge culinary talent with a tremendous amount of work ethic, but you don't have to work in a restaurant. That's not the only place to take it. Right. Exactly. And so, the you know, the biggest thing was 
was to make sure that they understood that there are spaces for them to shine that aren't necessarily the traditional restaurant path. You can definitely do this. Um, but yeah, girl, I was just like, let me know um, about this commercial kitchen situation because like for right. real, I was like, it's been something that I'm working on. It's been pressing on my mind for so long now because it, you, and I do think about that. I'm like, there's no professionally run places for women, for, for black people to kind of show up and create uh-huh. these businesses as, you know, and incubate their businesses so that people know that these, that their product is coming out of right. a professional certified right. kitchen. And, and then so have like a whole marketing team attached to it, like, oh, we're going to get you branded all the way up. We're going to get you right. We're going to get you right. Uh-huh. And, you know, and like I still do a lot of like my own private stuff on the weekends here in Arizona. <laughs> and one of the things I do is private cooking lessons. And every single time people are like, well, are you doing a group lesson? Are you going to do a group class? I'm like, I wish I had a space to do that. I don't right. have any that's spaces to do me. that, kids. <laughs> right. I can only do it in like people's houses. And and that's been pretty fun actually. But I do want to have my own space where people can come to. Yeah. But <laughs> but just circling back to just call me chef. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking like um people I guess aren't getting on board because I don't have that like one big thing behind me. You know what I'm saying? Like that one, like maybe if I was on Food Network or something like that is what people are are needing to be that stamp of validation okay she chef cat from so-and-so okay so maybe that's what it is I'm thinking maybe it, because I don't have like some big thing I, that I'm attached with but that's how you know it's real you know like it's organic right like I'm living just, it that's it, people try to play that game they, like, it's an excuse because there's so many other people out here who doing things and they ain't nobody they don't have no platform. They ain't got no money. They ain't got no real. They ain't got no real business plan. And somebody's throwing a couple of dollars at them, and they're going for ten for uh-huh. a while, and then it doesn't go anywhere. And then everybody's like, "Well, you know, it just didn't work out," and then they walk away. I was like, "Don't let you hand twenty five dollars to a black woman, and she turns it into two hundred and fifty, and then you right. like, well, uh, what did you do?" And it's like, "Oh, so now you got nine million questions. All right." That's, that's mm-hmm. cool. So you do, and I find that like black women, we will bootstrap, we will create our own resources mm-hmm. in order to make some things happen for ourselves um, because people aren't investing. And, it, and the hardest thing to, to really internalize is the fact that the people that look like you don't invest. Uh-huh. In. They don't invest any time, they don't right. invest any money. And so, you know, it's definitely a question I've kind of put to, um, other small groups of people that I talk to, it's definitely a question that we, I am definitely, you know, putting to, you know, the podcast audience at this point is like, what do we do as a community to support one another and to create some energy around being valid? Like, how do you validate black businesses unless you, you know, right. them and spend and stop, you know, and not you ain't. And I know I'm discounts. definitely not the most, I know I'm definitely not the most business savvy person. So I, it, it definitely starts with education for sure, because nobody's going to just hand over a bunch of money to someone that doesn't have a plan. So we need to get educated on, on writing business plans. Um, how, how are we going to actually spend that money, budgeting, things like that. So, so it's all circles back to education for sure. You got that right. And I, you know, for like someone like myself, like I actually have a, um, a certification from Wharton School of Business for entrepreneurship. And so like, you mm-hmm. know, you need me to help you write a business plan and create a pitch deck. Like what you need, mm-hmm. I got you. Yeah, and at the see, same that's time, exactly what we need. if I'm going to hand this over to somebody, you need to know what you're reading. Like if I hand right. you a pitch deck and you come back to me like, oh, this is nice. I'm like, did you know what you read? Like, for real? Right. What are you, what are you right. talking about? It definitely need to be like a little class situation. Girl. This is your yeah. pitch deck. This is this. This is that. This and, is your budget. This yep. is how we need yep. to finance things. This is whatever. And especially as move as business moves into a new era, like you're, you know, there was a time where you would have to take a business plan into a bank in order to get a loan. And that's just not how mm-hmm. people fund businesses anymore. So it's right. not just even learning that part. It's actually learning how to be agile in the space. Mm-hmm. So as new technology, right. the new methods and approaches to starting businesses, um, you know, find themselves into your, in, in, into your path, you have to know how to utilize those. Um, mm-hmm. Like I keep thinking about Pinky. Um, from Slutty Vegan. She's from Baltimore. We actually went to middle school together and I just keep looking at her every day like, all right, Pinky, I see you, sis. Like, that's what I'm talking about. And one of her interviews, she was like, I didn't know what I was doing. 
But I just knew that there was like a need for a uh, vegan mm-hmm. junk food. And she yeah. just did it. And she said, hey, I came up with this name. It was provocative. People told me to change the name, but I stuck with it. And, and it's just simple things like that. Like you come up with your rock solid concept, then, then the dollars will come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I actually went, uh, I was in Atlanta not too long ago and I was able to kind of, we, I was in the, uh, the kitchen space that she works out of, out of in Atlanta. And so I actually was able to like go by there and kind of peep, uh, that operation mm-hmm. a little bit, but it, it's absolutely true. Like sometimes it does take you just being thoroughly convinced that the world needs what you have and being prepared to sell it. Even if you don't have all the answers and even if you don't have all the puzzle pieces, the thing that you do have, most people will never possess. And that's the thing you're going to have to sell at the top and other people Uh will fall in line. You got to hire for your weaknesses, hire for your blind spots. That's when you start pulling in people more than you do. And like you said earlier, like that means your ego has to be pushed to the side because you Uh need people into your vision that can move it forward. And you might not know everything they know and that has to be okay. So right. with these last few moments, um, <laughs> what, what, what do we need to support you in? Um, obviously, how can we support you? Yeah, go ahead and throw some cash out here, y'all. Write some checks. I uh, mean, throw so some cash it. for sure. So with the calendar uh, last year, I had to bankroll everything myself. This stuff is not cheap. Last year, I was blessed to have a photographer that did it pro bono for me. I'm not that lucky this year, go real. So I have to pay my photographer. and She's amazing. Kate Grewal. Um, and I have to pay to get it printed and this stuff costs thousands of dollars. So definitely I'm probably thinking of putting up a GoFundMe or some sort of situation. So please stay on the lookout for that. Um, and I'm going to put up the pre-sales for the calendar. So you can go ahead and start purchasing the calendars. I'm not exactly sure when, probably August 1st, I'm going to throw out the pre-sales for the calendar. Um, and what else is going on with Just Call Me Chef? We're just raising money because I do want to be able to give out a scholarship um, at the end of the year to a student um, and some fun um, seed money to a business. Um, so that's what I definitely want to be known for, that we are giving out. Um, we are helping our sisters out h- however we can show up for one another. Definitely follow, help, so people can see. You know, when you look at somebody's page, like, oh, you only got 500 followers. Oh, you ain't serious. So followers definitely do better. So the more followers we can get, the better. So we're at justcallmechef.co on Instagram, Just Call Me Chef, um, on Facebook, and the website is justcallmechef.co. So, or if you want to collab with me or you want to hook up with any of the ladies that were in the last year's calendar or the upcoming calendar, just slide me a DM and we'll, we'll make that connection. We'll make that happen. Um, and yeah. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me reiterate here. These things don't work unless you support and don't be out here talking about, oh, this is great. And yeah, girl, do it, do it, do it. Put some money on it. Stop playing with me. Some money on it. I love your verbal support. I appreciate your financial though. Like come on now as a person who has tried to sell t-shirts and subscription boxes and all sorts of manner of things i know what it's like to have an audience of people be excited but then that that doesn't show up in a physical way and so what we need to do is stop paying each other lip service for great ideas and actually spend some money on investing and growing these ideas you can't be out here being pro-black with your fist up and you ain't spent a single dollar on a black owned business i don't want to hear from you ma'am you can miss yes, me with all are. of that fake that fake blackness, as I call it at this point. Um, <laughs> like my girls out here doing the work. Um, we have a generation of young people who are tremendously talented and deserve our support as well. So scholarships will help young black people go to college that probably would not otherwise. And they, they, it'll help them get trained and, you know, they deserve that. They deserve at least that from us. And so, you know, support the the next generation of, of talent and leadership. And, um, and again, put your dollars where your mouth is. Please. (laughs) Well, thank you so much um, for spending some time and carving out some time for me. I know the holiday is tomorrow, so I'm sure you might be out here trying to uh, make some potato salad for some kind of barbecue or something tomorrow. (laughs) So so, uh, I I just, you know, I just appreciate you. Thank you so much. I will, we will definitely be in each other's orbits again, considering that we have some definitely some kindred ideas here. And um, I think that you, like you said, as black women, 
um, who work in these industries unite more, I think we can definitely enlarge each other's visions and definitely support each other um, so we all can kind of move forward together. So thank you again. Thanks for having me. Thank Absolutely. Good all right. I will, we, will, we will catch up with you soon. Thank you for listening in on this week's conversation with Chef Kat. I'm excited that you have joined our community of thoughtful, ambitious, and informed listeners. I love to share the stories and experiences of inspiring and passionate people. And I'd also love to hear your feedback. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to leave a comment either on the website or wherever you've listened to today's podcast. Be sure to get the official podcast calendar, updates on new designs, exclusive discounts, and more when you become an Afros and Knives insider. Visit www.afrosandknives.com and sign up to become an insider today. Don't forget to purchase your official season one t-shirt in the Afros and Knives store and join the celebration. And thank you. podcast series is 100% listener supported. We love our community of listeners. To continue to see this podcast series grow, it needs your financial support. We want to add a video series and shine a spotlight on all that's brilliant and Black all over the world. Consider making a pledge or becoming a patron of Afros and Knives content today. Your generosity is deeply appreciated and is rewarded with early access to new episodes, limited edition products, and behind-the-scenes access to our production process. Visit www.afrosandknives.com to make a pledge of financial support today, and thank you.